Well, it's it's a true pleasure to be back here at the Architecture League. Um, I was a few years ago um, um, awarded with the Young Architects program, but now it's really nice to be back. And receiving this award at this uh, precise moment is um, especially meaningful to me. Uh, it makes me question my own work. It makes me think about how uh, my practice can further engage with the political and the social context and to me, this is very important because let's not forget that it is by making ourselves these questions that we can become somehow uh, part of the resistance. So thank you, Architecture League, uh, for building spaces for dialogue, exchange, and critique, and for building and strengthening a larger and more diverse network each day. I hope you uh, continue to pursue this mission no matter what borders are built or risen or what economic treatises are taken down. So. I'm just going to start this presentation with a with a story. Um, my work actually ranges from from very um, diverse uh, scales and scopes, from social housing to private commissions and furniture sometimes. Uh, but I want to focus for for this time uh, on the projects that have to do more a little bit with uh, the boundaries of, of what architecture is, and maybe touching uh, some other um, disciplines like art or design, maybe. So let me begin with, with a story of a very particular and funny Mexican object. This is uh, Mexican beans, uh, to be more precise, Mexican jumping beans. And they spontaneously and magically jump uh, without any apparent reason. And these, these beans trigger the discussion between Calois and Breton. Most of you must know this story already. Um, so Roger Calois and André Breton were, were having this fight over whether they should dissect these seeds to find the reason for this magical property to happen, this, this jumping thing. So Breton completely disagreed and called Calois uh, a positivist that was killing the magical thinking by looking for explanations. Of course, there was an explanation for that. It was this bug inside it. Uh, and Calois eventually broke up with, um, with Breton, and he continued to develop his, this curiosity in numerous texts. He was looking for something, something that was more the union between research and poetry, and I find this very, very interesting, and I would like to highlight it because I think it resonates with what I try to do with my work. And after many years, he published this beautiful book, uh, The Writing of Stones, and in the introduction um, chapter that Marguerite Jursenar uh, wrote, she describes the writing of stones as, as a text in which Calois made the transition from the intelligence which, which sees differences to the intelligence which sees likenesses. So what I find interesting in Calois' vision uh, is that it opens up the possibility to find a common axis between phenomena that's um, apparently the dissimilar. Um, these mineral formations that appear in the book are never static, but always uh, fluid and unstable if we see them through prolonged periods of time. Uh, the, the fusions, exterior forces, the pressure, and the imprints on the matter uh, may leave traces that, as your scenario was pointing out, uh, almost exactly resemble writings and which actually do transcribe events from millions of years ago. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that Calois was looking at a contradiction that also appears in architecture, uh, and, in, and it's very own nature, actually. It is simultaneously a precise snapshot of a particular historical moment, but at the same time is in continuous flux and transformation. But probably what I like to highlight here the most is the revelation that Calois allows us to discover, which is that through aesthetics we can find history. So um, the first project I would like to present uh, was presented in Liga Espacio Arquitectura, a small uh, architecture gallery in Mexico City, but a very important one. Um, and th the story here begins with this office building in downtown Mexico City. It seems to possess nothing in particular, but yet you have to stop and stare when you're passing by. It evokes the same kind of excitement um, that you find in, in a ruin. You have like this nostalgia for things that uh, belong to the past, but certainly this is not a ruin. Um, as opposed to the process of erosion that a ruin may undergo, this building seems to slowly accumulate the signs of time 
and, um, and social life. Its materiality makes it hard to define the limit between the interior and the facade. Although the, although the glass curtain uh, wall remains practically untouched, the facade appears to be more like a shoreline that recedes and grows somewhere between construction and decay. So you can see here a detail. Uh, the fact that the facade is, has remained intact, what current, concurrently changing, might be the reason one is drawn to building and why I continue to think it may have something to reveal. Behind the glass facade, one can read the half-hidden narrative that inhabits the space through its material customization. Every curtain, drywall addition, and or taped window compounds uh, express the facade split nature, one divided across identity and representation. You can see it here, like this double personality. So this building makes me think that facades mat materialize character, whether intended for that purpose or not, and perform their function the same way we perform our social face. In the case of Mexican character, Octavio Paz, one of our most prominent poets and writers, pointed out that if that we perform it sim simultaneously on one hand as a shield or a wall, and on the other as a symbol covered surface or a hieroglyph. So the facade has an etymological origin in facha that points out its instrumentality as the public face of the building, while at the same time uh, it shares the etymological root with facere, which is to do. Uh, which suggests that the mechanism of construction of an identity is simultaneously a projection and appropriation. Uh, the facade then, uh, arguably, uh, works as a collective mirror stage, a representation of the relationship of individuals and the relations uh, and real conditions of collective existence. Um, it works almost like simultaneously as a face and a mask, uh, as, as the Los Aguatari were, were describing, like the mask is not hiding the face, it is the face. Um, and in Mexico, in our race towards development, uh, our past became somehow something of our ballast or something that would stood between us and our progress. So we conveniently dis decided to sweep this past under the carpet um, of historical discourse and almost flatten our reality into a single official national identity that accompanied this uh, international style search. Um, development had produced an oxymoronic effect on what would um, on on this kind of uh, duality between unfolding and opening out, and for me this this building was an example of how um, this ubiquitous but anonymous modernist building can see can be actually conceived as with this apparent neutrality, but at the same time it reveals its own genesis, like this uh, sculpture fr from Giuseppe Pennone. It seems to defy almost the notion that Juliana Bruno was posing at some point where she said, in some way the modernist architecture does not absorb the passing of time. So like the rings on this tree, uh, uh, this building actually bears the mark of duration, life, and weathering. And it reveals how the other Mexico, this kind of um, suppressed, repressed uh, past that we have, reappears in the modern Mexico. We have this underlying stratum of social psyche and the uh, intangible reality formed by beliefs or fragments of beliefs and concept of history that Paz explored in his writings and manifested um, and is manifested in this transparent mask. So for, for the exhibition, the methodology of this research was recognizing the, the wall or the curtain wall as almost a, a liminal zone of exchange. This transparent surface uh, was, mm, we, I, I drew a parallel uh, of this surface almost like a threshold between the face and the mask and between oneness and otherness. So the, during this production, the first step was to photograph each one of these windows and to identify the repetitions and the difference between each one of, the, of them. So uh, the series of interior accretions actually reveal the social life for space, um, shadow, storage, adaptations. You can also see the relationship between the transparency in some of the cases like this one, uh, where it's actually like advertising something or even sometimes uh, religious belief, as, as, as uh, you will see in, in the next picture. Um, so what, what this building taught me, in a way, was that the, modern, modern, the problem of modernism 
is not the problem of the skin as we probably thought before. Uh, this building is as many ones, and it acknowledges the possibility of not eliminating the otherness, but to reconcile with it. So this is the, the, um, the presentation in Liga. It was a three-way mirror that reflected all this stratigraphy of the building. And it reveals something uh, that's also present in our past, and that has to do with this uh, deity from Aztec mythology, Xipetotec, um, or also called Lord or the Flayed One. And Xipetotec embodies two seemingly contradictory conditions, accretion and renewal. Uh, Xipetotec didn't actually own a face, but wore a mask. His, his, his skin was just a temporary envelope and was destined to shed eternally. So just like the, the pyramid, this um, current face is just an announcement of something that has an underlying layer. Um, and you can see that this has been historically present in, in Mexico and continues to be in our current mother Mexico. So jumping to something that's a little bit more like on the side of traditional architecture, um, I would like to show you this project. It's called From Territory to Inhabitant. Um, it's a commission made by Infonavit, the Federal Institute for Workers Housing in Mexico, the largest uh, mortgage la lender in Latin America. Uh, they usually um, add every 53 seconds one credit, so that's the numbers. And prior to this initiative, uh, Infonavit was de dedicated exclusively to urban and peri-urban housing. This is the first time that they work with rural housing. So we're really uh, thrilled to participate in this kind of initiative. And our main goal was to think the best way to reduce the debt, uh, the debt cycle for, for the account holders and to break the, the, the cycle of dependency as well. So we were starting looking at this. Uh, you, you probably are very familiar with this diagram by Frank Doffy and Stuart Brand. Uh, when, well, they uh, divide the spaces in six different layers from the most permanent uh, one, which is the site, and then the structure and so forth until you arrive to the less permanent, which is stuff. Um, so we started exploring the site that we were assigned was in Tasco, Guerrero. Uh, it's traditionally a mining town. It's one of the oldest mining towns in Mexico, but now it, it's also sharing this condition of being a touristic town. Uh, it, it was named um, Magical Town. This, this is a term that we use in Mexico for touristic spots that have like this uh, colonial past. Uh, so we tried to understand the site with, within these layers. There was the site, which is this, that, that they have like a very steep topography. And uh, what people usually do is that they create this very um, basic structure and then they build a skin around it, but sometimes the skin starts uh, copying this style of being colonial just to, to continue to, to belong to this magical town um, structure. So there was a contradiction between what, what is really happening in the house right here and what uh, people wanted it to look like. So there's like this idea of uh, almost um, imagining being in a colonial town. And then there's a um, displaced plan, which is very flexible, and eventually you arrive to uh, the program and finally to the furniture. So um, what we had to do was to propose a solution that um, had this dichotomy of having to provide adaptability and stability at the same time. So we wanted to do most with the site, which is the most expensive and, of course, the most permanent of the conditions. And then we decided to join together the structure and the skin in one single thing so that the, in the, the initial payment would be the most effective one for the family. And it's very simple. It's just four walls and a vault. Uh, and within it, you have this uh, group of services that can be grouped here, but also they can be played around within the house. Uh, and the structure and the skin does not interfere at all with this structure. And then you have the space, a space plan that's very flexible because of that. And finally, you have the furniture and stuff. So this is one of the renderings of the interior with, without any of the additions or the, the implosion of uh, incremental growth that happens within the house. Usually what happens uh, with housing is that um, 
uh, we propose as architects incremental housing, but it happens outside the house. It's like an unfinished house that eventually families need to finish. But in this case, the structure is finished and then the, the rooms grow within the house. So this is um, one of the sections. Um, and you can see here how this can be extended to cover and have a second floor all over the house. This is interior progression. Uh, and you can see here that the first uh, proposal, the stage one, is to have a single room with an exterior space, maybe. Uh, it's very small, it's just 39 square meters, and it, the total cost is around $6,500. No, $6, uh, for the next stage, you can have this, this window moved to the front if you want to, so you can have an extension and a first bedroom, and so on. Then you can build a staircase, and a, and a first bedroom, a second one, and finally a third one, with a total of 78 square meters and around, well, less than $9,000 for, for the total house. These are some of the, of the mock-ups that we developed at the office, and you can see here uh, how this house can actually be combined with many others, because there's a second strategy, which is the one of aggregation. Uh, the envelope cost uh, the walls and the ceiling cost around uh, $1,300. Uh, but you, we can also use this wall as a double uh, partition for two houses and therefore start saving money for families who start building this together. So they, they start splitting the cost for these shared walls. And at the same time, they have another condition of sharing these patios which at the same time uh, allows for different family configurations. So sometimes all of, all of these programs are just uh, focused on a very specific group of people, uh, on the nucle nuclear family like this one, but then all of these other family configurations are left behind, so we truly believe that this is an opportunity to generate different relationships between neighbors and different combinations. So you can see here, for example, you have a farmer family where this is like a barn for the animals and then this is a house which can be expanded within inside it. And for example, you can have an extended family where you have a larger social area and then two um, more private spaces for the two families and then an assembled family with maybe uh, a space for a small uh, store uh, or different configurations. So this is uh, the houses following topography. And the idea was to generate a, a model or a scheme that would fit uh, either on a rural background or on a more peri-urban or urban landscape. So actually, it could be like freestanding like this or within a more urban environment, just like this one. This is like the unfinished houses that we were just seeing before. The next project is uh, uh, for Museo Experimental El Eco, and it also has to do with these layers of uh, the programmatic layer, or the more spontaneous one that the, that the, user, the, that the user allows uh, to happen. So Museo El Eco uh, was designed by Matias Geritz, and it has uh, a very, very strong personality. It's, it's a very strong architecture, so it was quite a challenge to try to um, fit the program, which was uh, a summer pavilion uh, that had to be very flexible to accommodate many of, of the museum's programs, such as uh, public cinema or lectures or events. So to start with the idea, um, we were talking a lot about the work of Brenda Lozano. Uh, she's a very young and talented Mexican writer. And in, a, in an interview, she was mentioning that her work was very similar to the work of a bricklayer. She just was laying one word on top of the other and building phrases uh, in layers just less, like a bricklayer did. So if this was true, then we could also draw a parallel between architecture and concrete poetry. So um, we were following a little bit of Ferreira Goulart's concepts on concrete poetry, where the, where the concrete poem or ideogram becomes a relational field of functions, but also where the maximum of expression is uh, achieved through a minimum of words. So our basic word, of course, was the cinder block, which we can find everywhere in Mexico City. The cinder block is modular, it's industrial, 
It's very compact and almost like ubiquitous in Mexico City, but it allows all of these uh, forms of expression from breeze walls to staircases to little windows to uh, patios to balconies. So it was very important to understand how this uh, image that is very present in the city could, could come back again, again in the form of a pavilion. Um, just like this little drawing by Agnes Martin, laying the bricks on a very strict pattern could actually allow the difference to be shown. For example, you can see here like the, 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 the hand when it gets tired, the, 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 the line gets a little bit thicker, or maybe when the, the pencil loosen, loosens its sharpens, uh, the sh sharpness, then maybe uh, it starts like getting a little bit thicker again, or the same irregularities start to show. So this is the pattern that we proposed, and this is a program that the museum proposed. But on top of that, there was uh, the possibility for people to reconfigure the space just by changing a, a few of the letters, so, to say so, and to change completely the meaning from campo or field to amo or I love you. Uh, and then you can see these two girls playing in the space. This is the courtyard, as you can see, it has a very strong presence, the color, this uh, column, this yellow column, the trees uh, uh, and the, the gray wall. And then these girls are just playing and um, building their own little universe within this space. And you can actually see the spontaneous and the program layer together. Also, some other artists appropriated the space, such as uh, Pia Camille and her group El Resplandor. They wanted us to, to build uh, an an igloo, uh, which was impossible because of the geometry of the cinder block. We convinced them to, to just do a circle. And well, this is how the space was used for some of the lectures. And at the end, there was a, also something that we wanted to do, which was uh, to make the pavilion disappear in a way. So you could go to the pavilion and maybe just borrow or take one cinder block, and just, just bring it home. You could take 10 and maybe finish your bookshelf, or if you wanted to take 1,000, maybe you could finish uh, your, your little studio, or if you wanted to take them all, maybe you could build a house, and that was a way of the pavilion returning back to this original idea of coming back from the city. And this project had um, a second iteration, or like a revision, more recently uh, for the Chicago Biennial. This was a project we did, uh, at the Stoli Islands Arts Bank. And it was along the same lines of Eleco Pavilion, but it was following more uh, these uh, words by Carl Andre, parts, pile, piles, broken, pieces, stack, elastic, stacked, identical, interchangeable. The project creates a, a series of uh, spaces to complement the Astrogate story, Stony Island Bank. This is a bank that was abandoned in the 70s and that uh, eventually was built by the Astrogates and that now houses a series of um, venues for artists and scholar residencies uh, and it is a home for the Rebuild Foundation's archives and collections. So as you can see, the context has changed quite a bit. There, there used to be constructions here but now all of these are gone. Um, in the area, there are a number of, of abandoned buildings. This is the, the before and after intervention of the Astor. And you can see here uh, how on the south side of Chicago, it's usually uh, this part of, of the, the block that is abandoned first. So that, that was really striking to me because coming from a Mexican context, this is the first thing or, uh, that, that gets occupied and is the last thing to, to be uh, emptied because this is the most valuable piece of land. This is the one that has a corner, two streets, and here in Chicago it's happening all the, all the way uh, around. So this conflict um, unfolds literally in space. Uh, appropriation is confused with domination and the exchange value, of course, uh, overshadows the use value. And as a consequence, the streets are peppered with these empty lots uh, and heaps of terracotta bricks, sometimes even from uh, historical buildings like this church, which is like a few, was a few blocks away from the Stony Island Bank. Uh, and the demolition debris uh, is used to create 
in this case, for this proposal, a series of courtyards uh, that, that will happen on this space right here, on this site. So this is a proposal. Uh, these are the stacks. The Astrigate is not only an artist, he's also a collector of these rare objects. He has a collection of trees, of bricks, of walls, of cabinets, of chairs, of every kind of object you, you can imagine. So we proposed to him that maybe we should use these bricks that come from these demolitions and use them simply stacking them like in a very simple manner on a very simple pattern that could uh, do walls and, and floors. Uh, and use them to create these smaller courtyards that have a thick wall to protect them, almost like um, trying to, uh, be pr to, to belong to the interior world more, more than the outside world, which is a little bit hostile at the moment, and then eventually deconstructing itself and maybe slowly disappearing into something else. So this is the different uh, p the courtyards, uh, some of them are a little bit more like folies or something more playful. Sometimes they're a little bit more practical, like this forum. And one of them is really symbolic, which is this uh, taller tower right here, which could be constructed by all the bricks uh, from the church, which it would be this one. So the, the idea is that all of these walls eventually start to dissolve with time and become something that's a little bit more like an open garden that eventually grows a little bit wilder and has a little bit more vegetation and less walls. It's almost like trying to think about an, an inverse uh, Tower of Babel where everyone is meeting instead of separating themselves from each other. This is... Um, another project uh, that we recently finished and presented uh, for the Oslo Architecture Triennale, uh, which was called After Belonging. Uh, the, 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 the program was really interesting. It was questioning the ways in which we um, uh, res um, live and stay in transit. And uh, we were wondering, like, what would could we say from Mexico, and of course it was about migration, uh, you all know that it, during the 80s and the 90s, Mexico experienced this uh, very dramatic neoliberal restructuring that triggered northbound migration. And of course this uh, provoked a lot of decline in the rural economies throughout the country, especially in the states of Michoacán and the central area in Mexico. So labor mi migration, however, offer this uh, promise of progress that is rarely fulfilled. And you can see it in this series of pictures by Pia Camille that I'm presenting now. So this journey entails uh, numerous costs, not only for the ones who leave, but also for the ones who stay. Usually what happens is there's a transference of uh, the responsibilities uh, um, between those who are left behind, especially uh, to women and the younger women and the, are the ones who take care of the elderly as, as, the, as the mother goes out to work so the father could leave um, uh, and cross the border um, and so on and so forth. So we were dealing a lot with this idea of nostalgia uh, and nostalgia, they were, we were revising the, the, the very own concept of, of, of nostalgia coming from nostos, which is return home and alja, longing. So it's a longing for a return home. But we were looking also at the definition that Svetlana Boim was giving to this, this idea. And she was stating, and we completely agree, that at the first glance, a longing is a longing for a place, but actually it is a yearning for a different time. So what we're seeing here is that um, immigrants actually are, are trying to hold on to this idea or a possibility of a house, but actually are just creating this cycle of uh, never being able to arrive home because when they leave, what happens usually is that they send the money back in this uh, way of remittances, which is also a way of, of success uh, for, for the community. But out, that, on, that only helps for the next generation to cross the border. So this, there's this cycle almost like um, this uh, Penelope cycle where, where you're weaving this idea of a house, but at the same time during the night you're almost unweaving it continuously. So what we developed, uh, this, this work I uh, did in, con in, in collaboration with Guillermo Ruiz de Teresa, and we did a, 
this kind of calculation, it's it's almost very symbolic because we were trying to figure out all all the factors that come into this idea of the initial area of what the territory is worth and then how eventually it starts shrinking and shrinking and shrinking as, the, as time passes by. So the more you try to hold on to this territory and the more you try to give it a, a value, the more it starts like shrinking, shrinking and losing uh, its own value, which is a contradiction. So uh, for the for the Biennale, what we decided to do was to uh, collect earth from this town near La Colula in in, in, in Michoacan, one of the, the, the places where more where, where most migration happens in Mexico, uh, and to fill the area that we were given for the exhibition. It was a three by three meters uh, space. So we designed a platform that had a tilted. Um, edge so eventually all of this earth would start like moving down and shrinking like like literally be a shrinking territory and along the way we found uh, many difficulties um, the first thing that happened was that it was not possible to import uh, soil uh, from um, Latin America to Norway uh, only from the uh, European Communion so so we decided to do a little cheating and we um, pulverized the the soil a little bit more and we exported it as pigment instead of soil that was that was fine but then when we were trying to get the soil across the border we we came to realize that it was not possible to take it out because in Mexico soil is considered patrimony so it was like kind of this very complex contradiction because we were talking about how it was completely losing all of its value symbolically and economically, but at the same time, we, they wouldn't let us take it out. So eventually we, we managed to, to, to get away with what we were trying to do. And this is the, the box with the tilted uh, edge. And this is like slowly shrinking uh, through the period of the, um, the Oslo Triennial. This is another project that deals more with this idea of what the audience and the, the speaker is about. This uh, was presented in the Lesbian Architecture Triennial with Jose Esparza as a curator. Uh, it was presented for the new public's program. And the basic thing that uh, Jose was asking us to do was to challenge and to question the relationship between speaker and audience. So, um, this was uh, one of his introduction texts for, for the new states, uh, the new public's forum. And what we started to do was just to circle or to highlight all the things that were central for our project. So the, there was this idea of making something that was completely uh, non hierarchical and that was the circle, of course. And then how can we change this dynamic from being just a speaker to being speaker and audience? So uh, this was the solution. It was a flat surface, a circular surface with a faceted uh, surface underneath that eventually would uh, work as this uh, kind of seesaw where the audience would play like a lot of weight and as much audience you would have, it would be uh, your, like the higher would be the voice. Uh, other condition that was uh, required was uh, for this um, stage to be flexible to present Andres Jaque superpowers of 10 play. So uh, the proposal we did was to put a curtain around it and invert this idea of scenario and the, the, um, the audience. So eventually what would happen is that people would be sitting on the platform and the, um, the backdrop would be actually the city. It's just reframing with this curtain that would um, eventually create this, this new dynamic and making forcing people to look at the city with new eyes. Then there was uh, the challenge of trying to find the perfect plaza for this um, for this civic stage. Uh, of course, all of the plazas of, of Lisbon are beautiful, but they're very symmetrical and they're always uh, right next to either a public building or a religious building or a theater or something like very, very strong. Uh, in, in our research, we were looking at Plaza Rocio, which is this one. And we were thinking, well, maybe we can create this symmetry with this um, subway station, um, like uh, ventilation, um, area 
and maybe create this kind of symmetry here. And we will, while we were looking at this, we discovered this little plaza, Plaza Figueiras, which is a public space but could not be considered uh, a civic stage. This is more like a transit space. It has a subway station, a parking lot, um, like the the bus station here, taxis. So this becomes just like a pathway either to the center of the city or to some other areas, but nothing really happens here, no exchange, no no life at all. And there's also something really funny. There's this uh, question uh, sculpture, uh, King, King John the uh, First, but he's actually off center. It was like as if someone thought of moving him because like there's this street, which is facing uh, the river, and almost like they moved him so he could have a nice view, which was really odd. And then we decided just to place the, this object behind him just to create like this counterweight to whatever he was denying to the, to the public space. So this, you can see how he has a nice view. And this is a Mexican tortilla, it landed on, on Lisbon. Uh, the whole thing was produced in Mexico. It was cheaper to produce it in Mexico and then ship it to, to Lisbon, which also talks about like this disparities between the economies. And this is the, the piece as it was installed in the plaza. And this is during the, the Triennal. There was, um, there were like two or th three different programs. One of them was really interest, uh, interesting. This is the Majoral Act, where all the candidates for Major for Lisbon were participating here. They were really engaged with the public. Each one of them presented their proposals, and then eventually like people were able to, to discuss or ask them questions. And then this is Andres Gakas' play. And as you can see, something really interesting happened here. Uh, we were all sitting. Of course, we, these, are, these are all architects, as we usually gather together. And people were started like coming out of the balconies, like asking this question of what, what are these people doing here? Like, are they taking this uh, collective shower or what's, what's going to happen here? And then eventually Andres Hake um, started uh, his play, which is uh, very interesting and, of course, very colorful and lively. And then we had this double audience, the audience that, that was on the balconies, ourselves, and then we had this layer of characters combined with some people who, are, who were just passerbys, but then sometimes found themselves immersed in this uh, alternative reality that uh, Andres Jaque was uh, giving us. Um, this is uh, the proposal we, we did for um, the Young Architects Program for MoMA PS1. Uh, this is a mistake, this is PS1. Um, and one of the main topics that we were strongly advised to, to consider was the, this idea of sustainability, which is no doubt uh, something that should be central in all, all of our practices. Um, and we were thinking that uh, about this idea of um, the biostratigraphical signal, signal that we're living in this planet, uh, we have transformed almost a, like a third and a half of the left land surface of the planet, and our trace will be in, in like permanently uh, delineated in the surface of Earth. So the impact um, that we have is really, really strong, and, but sometimes it's just like very, very simple actions that allow us to uh, see this kind of relationship between uh, what, what we want to do in terms of sustainability and how simple it is to really approach the matter. So uh, we thought that the most efficient and responsible way to achieve this uh, MoMA courtyard uh, potential was through the basic act of redistributing ground. So the, the following the courtyard's geometry, we did a very simple operation of uh, tracing a triangle and then uh, extracting, uh, doing this perimeter with uh, borrowed steel plates, the kind of they use for uh, repaving the streets. Uh, so we were renting these steel plates, creating this kind of perimeter, and then excavating one third of the triangle and shifting the, the, the soil to these other two sections so we could have um, an angle. So the operation was very simple, subtraction, addition, and then you had this whole new landscape that had two very different conditions and therefore changed the whole 
uh, courtyard. This is a floor plan. One of the things we, we realized is that previous um, iterations of the pavilion, of the, uh, yeah, of the program, included uh, a lot of like lighter uh, interventions, most of them as, as a form of a ceiling, and we wanted to create something that would contrast highly with, with that, that idea. So that was also one of the reasons that we wanted to create something that was very strong, heavy, and, from, and came from the ground. And that um, that simple form would actually remind us of many, many different uh, situations, like from the contemplative uh, ruin, which is something that's incomplete or maybe unfinished or just eroded, to the more didactical or political as a forum, and to, then to the more dramatic uh, and theatrical, like this performance space, or of course the party, because that was what it, it was about or maybe like night projections or something a little bit more playful for kids like this um, pool of uh, foam uh, balls. These are some of the models that were presented and the form as you can see is really, really simple and it's the basic idea is just to have something that has a very strong presence but comes from almost nothing and that eventually of course dissolves into nothing. I'm just going to present uh, two more projects. Uh, this was a commission um, we, we had by Legorreta and Legorreta, another very uh, successful uh, office in Mexico City, one that's very well uh, consolidated and known, and most of you must, must know them. Uh, they were doing these uh, dormitories for the GSB uh, school in Stanford University. And they wanted us to design um, a breeze wall because they had seen one of the projects um, that we designed, La Tallera, which I'm going to show next. And we were having like a very hard time trying to design something that we had already done, which is the, the, the lattice, the, 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 the cinder block uh, breeze wall. So uh, during this period, I was talking a lot to, to my sister Maria, who has a major in English literature, and she began discussing with me uh, this third chapter of uh, Ulysses uh, by James Joyce, uh, the, the chapter is Proteus, uh, where Stephen uh, Dedalus is working in the shore trying to figure out the, the, the conditions of existence, uh, of, of, of what, what the real world is and the different ways in we can apprehend it in a way. And um, he mentions that, first of all, there is a space to, be, to apprehend, and it's vast and almost um, ungraspable. And you can see how colors splash from one thing to the other, and that is what actually forms one individual or one thing, and you are able to discern one from another. Uh, but there's this other layer where Stephen uh, asks, how can we discern these bodies? And he uh, answers himself by knocking on them. Uh, it's almost like he invites us to perceive the, the world differently by shutting our eyes and actually seeing. So when he closes his eyes uh, and, and, and listens to his boots uh, crashing uh, the small uh, shells in the shore, he finds that uh, he's just a stride in time a very short space of time through very short times of space. And this revelation and, and this conversation I was having with my sister um, allowed me to create this wall that could become more than a wall and could turn into something that was more of a gate. So um, the, basis, the basic idea was to, to think about how our, our bodies occupy space in very tiny, tiny spaces. Uh, or how we splice different moments uh, in, in, within that space, and it is just through movement, just like this musical score. And you can see also here how this movement is actually activating this, this uh, music box. So time belongs to this realm of the audible or um, the things in succession. Uh, I'm, 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 um, this, there's this term, uh, uh in German. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the, the language, and, and which is supposed to Nieveinde, uh, which refers to the things that are placed one next to the other or the modality of the visible space. So uh, 
Stephen is trying to understand the world through this audible uh, um, promenade or through rhythm and time. And Stephen states, my, my ash, my ash uh, sword hangs at my side, tap with it, they do. And he's talking about his walking stick. He knows with it on the ground because he knows that's what blind people do. And it's what sometimes we do. As, we, as we're kids, we move through space and we play with space in different ways other than with our sight. So I imagine this piece is a visible entity, almost discernible to what the eye is. It has a body and ultimately it's unfinished. But it is true that it exists, it's out there, uh, just as a book that is not printed, but it's already written. And it was just like a, almost like a drawing a parallel to what this uh, idea of movement and light could be and how you could transform something architectural, uh, architectural into something rhythmical. So it was all about translating this kind of score into something that would be uh, more a void and solid. And when you move through the space, you could actually create some kind of uh, musical score. So this is the basic structure. And then you can see how it is just a folded screen that has different lengths. And the longer the lengths, the, high, the lower the tone. And the shorter the length, uh, the higher the tone. Um, it's uh, folded metal. We developed uh, the engineering with Saner Company. And this is one of the renderings. Uh, we just finished a few months ago. So you can see here how the, the spaces could be shorter or larger, depending on what the tone needs to be achieved. So this is the, the final result. We don't have final pictures of this yet. But this gives you a basic idea of what the, the, what the space looks like during the day and during the night. And finally, and very quickly, I'm just going to uh, go through uh, this, which was my first public commission, uh, La Tallera Siqueiros. Uh, it used to be the house and workshop for David Alfaro Siqueiros, one of our most prominent uh, artists and muralists in Mexico. It was in complete decay when, when the competition happened, as you can see here. And he, this was the condition. There's this plaza right here. And this was actually his, um, it was almost like a uh, work courtyard. You can see that here he was designing some of his murals. The plus is right here. The, the picture was photographed from this point towards this one. So these are the, the gigantic structures that are, that are needed for, for these murals to be held up. Um, this is another view. This would be the future plaza. This is just like a field at, the, at that time. Uh, and you can see the structure here. And this is the interior courtyard. The, the drawing would be right here. So you get an idea of wh what the contradiction was here. The courtyard was closing in uh, the, the, the murals to the public, but these were public art. So it was really something that just needed to open up to the, to the public space and just breathe again. So this was a strategy. This is the plaza. The murals, as, as I was showing you, this is a, the, the two big structures. And what we just did was just slowly shifted this into a new position uh, in order for it to open the space. And you can see here that the relationship changes completely just by doing this simple move. Uh, the murals had to be restructured anyway, so the new program uh, was um, pr uh, presented here. This is the cafeteria, and this is the bookshop, the archive, and um, the reading room. This is the original building. And what needed to do, uh, what we needed to do also was to consolidate it as, as an institution, as something that was not fragmented and improvised, but it was something a little bit more of a presence to the public. Um, so you can see here all the operations, no, from like all these little holes that we needed to fill out with program and eventually how it was a little bit more of a compact uh, a scheme. It was almost like unfolding the space by giving up uh, one area we were actually gaining a plaza, but at the same time the plaza was uh, given to the public. So there was like this contradiction, but also uh, um, an opportunity there. So this is the, the result. This is the, the, the plaza. This is uh, the courtyard as it opened up. Uh, this is the cafeteria. And you can see that there's a condition where actually the the 
the workshop is slightly higher than the street level, so we actually had this slope, and that actually helped us a lot to conceal uh, the entrance of the cafeteria and the library, the bookshop, I'm sorry. This is this is like all the, the little volumes that were just uh, standing around, and then we decided to, to use this breeze wall, this concrete uh, screen, to cover uh, all of the facade, to give it a little bit more of a presence. And of course, Cuernavaca is uh, a very um, uh, warm city, it has a fantastic weather, so it allowed us to have all these uh, open spaces and these interior courtyards within it. The original building is the one that's painted in white, and all of the additions are the ones that are left with, a raw, uh, with raw materials. So you can really read the difference without really knowing. Um, and also the screen allows uh, for these moments to happen when you can actually see some of what's uh, behind the wall, no? like from, from these specific orchards to, to some of the, the studios and the shops. And uh, that difference that I was talking about, this ramp, uh, actually helped to create these inner or hidden quarters as well. And you know that uh, you're successful when you don't have a public, but then eventually they embrace it. And we have like this uh, banda who eventually decided to to do their, their music video. You can find it on Vimeo. And they used La Taller as a background, so we were very pleased to see that we resonated with our public. And um, thank you so much for the, for the opportunity, and well, hope to see you soon. <laughs> nice.